Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Hello, you're listening to the podcast, So There I Was. It's how all great aviation tales begin. This is episode 128. They love you until you pump one into the stands. Oh! <laughs> Don't do it. Oh, man. Sponsor this week is none other than FTIRatings.com. Looking to up your game as a professional pilot? Go to FTIRatings.com and see about getting your ATP, CTP, or a type rating in a smelly old airplane? No. In no. Full, flat, full motion simulator, my friend. Right? Yeah. So talk more about that during the show got a uh, yeah we got, well we uh, got uh, we got long hands videos yeah on our uh, on our on the page for the patreon right yep for, for the patreons and i sent out a link to those who donate directly through our website at so there i was that us slash donate so those folks got a link and the, and the patreon pilots got a link or actually the video itself, it's about 97 minutes, Fig, and it is great. Yeah, in fact, you haven't seen it yet. I got the DVD from a relative of Lawman's, and through through her got permission from Lawman to put it up. It's about 97 minutes. Much of it is a cockpit-mounted camera looking at Lawman while he's flying with the blues, flying practices, flying... Uh, it shows there's also he's flying one of the team members. I guess when the Blues leave the team, the 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 support troops, they get a ride in a jet if they so choose. And then they get to choose that their pilot. Is, so this is one of the rides he gave. a great Benny to being on mm-hmm. that team, right? Holy shit. Right? So cool. So this, pilot, uh, this guy chose Lawman as his pilot. And that's cool. in there. And then there's some actual show footage with, you know, professional news reporters and all that. I got another one that was actually like a Disney Channel documentary, and I don't know how we're going to work that because that's got that's some copyrighted stuff in there. I'll try and figure something out, you know, share it with a friend. But but yeah, Yeah. that's ninety seven minutes up there. So there was that us slash Patreon that'll get you there, and and that's it's an amazing amazing video. Also, we got a, another five star rating this week, Fig. Oh, I'm loving these five stars. Thank you, everybody. How do you get there? How do you give us a rating, Fig? So there I was. Dot us slash rate. There it is. It's plain and simple. Go there. It'll take you to help you either drop a rating on uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to listen. This one is five stars. It's great podcast. Love the stories, great hosting and guests. Given it's so U.S. centric, why don't you get some UK RAF pilots? And a few of them have done exchanges with the U.S. Navy and USMC, flying F-14s and 18s, and baby Super Hornet. Keep up the great work. I prefer the longer episode format purely from a selfish perspective, as I drive long distances regularly. But I'll take what I can get. Keep them coming, boys. London is 39. So, well, there's feedback. Maybe we go back to the longer ones. This is our second show with Bart, who yeah. we, we recorded just shy of two hours with him, and we're breaking it into three shows. This one starts with him taking over in, in Iraq. Yeah, change of command in a combat zone. That's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. And, and it, was, it, was not a, it was scheduled. It was not a bad thing for the guy going out. Right, right, right. <laughs> So that's it. I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up because that's usually that, that's usually what happens in a combat zone. But no, this was yeah. Good. yeah. So we had a couple other possible titles. I pushed the believe, but I pushed the I believe button, yeah. and then he talked about how he really made a difference getting that lightning pod up and running that targeting pod for the Harrier. That was a cool piece yeah. of gear that I wish we'd have had a chance yeah, to play with. Huh? Holy cow! Yeah. So, and he was out there impressing the Hornet guys with it. Going, wait a minute, how'd you get that great piece of gear? We got this piece of crap. Right. Well, it's a good story. It's a good story how it all came about. It is. It is typical Marine Corps ingenuity too to get it done. Yeah. You know, Bart retired as a as a major general in uh, in the Marine Corps, but once again, I think we mentioned it last week. I mean, this guy is just so humble and kind and mild mannered. You would never know this guy is a, no. a Marine Corps general. No, no, you wouldn't. So, yeah. So, a lot of fun to sit and chat with him. 
So we got this week's stories. Next week, I promise you, you're going to want to tune in. He teased it at the opening of last week, and he's going to circle back next week and talk about his experience as a prisoner of war in in Iraq in, in Gulf War One. So what do you think, man? Should we get out the way? I say we get out of the way. Yeah. You've got to go back to work. Fig is recording this intro in uniform I am. in a major metropolitan airport in the United States. Changing I, uh, planes. <laughs> I gotta, we got. We got. We got. We got to let this thing go because I got to go. Go. Go get them. <laughs> Stay out of the hurricane's path, brother. <laughs> hey, here's a true story about crossing the pond at night in the world's smallest cockpit on the tanker through the weather. Oh, and to the uh, tanker crew who uh, did that. Thanks a lot. We really appreciated that. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Well, there I was, crossing the pond, and you could see that I wasn't exactly fun. Hey, welcome back to So There I Was. We're back with Bart, also known as Thor, Thor the God, God of, of War. War. <laughs> but that didn't last very long, so we're just back to Bart. And, uh, less than four a seconds. Less than a minute. That call signs lasted. It was awesome. It was awesome for a minute, and I really appreciate that. I was there with you. I thought, what a great way to make a change. You're the right. skipper of the squadron. You should have what you want. And then the captain in the back of the room said, "Yeah, no, sit, sit down, you Bart. Sit down, skipper. Uh, sit down, Bart." I, I had to uh, uh, sticks uh, put up the VMA 542s squadron patch on the. There it is, uh, squadron emblem patch. And it reminded me, when we were out in uh, Cherry Point in May for the air show, uh, Repeat and I, along with a couple other old uh, old Harrier guys, got a tour of VMFA 542 in the new F-35. And Chewy was very gracious to give us a hands-on tour of the airplane in the hangar and let us play with his you know million dollar helmet or whatever they cost these days it was it was pretty cool so when were you the skipper of 542 2004 went to iraq with them remember lieutenant colonel arnold so we actually went there yeah iraq 2004 and then we did a change of command in iraq in 2004, June of 2004, and I oh. stayed, stayed there till November of 2004 in Iraq, and then you know I had the squadron for two years. Oh, but it awesome. was yeah, it was a great. Uh, Were you flying then, out of? We flew out of Al Assad, Iraq. Al Assad, yeah, that's what I said. Yep. Al-Assad. And remember that was just we just had done the Fallujah attack, the first yep. Fallujah attack. We stopped it about three weeks early, three weeks early, three weeks into it, two weeks into it. Who was it? Uh, General Amos was the Maw commander. Okay. And then we did the second Fallujah attack. What was that? November of 2004. And so, yeah, Harriers were all over that. Just awesome opportunity to participate in, you know, city fighting, you know, with a Harrier, with lightning pods, precision strikes, and Marines doing what Marines do good, best. Yeah. Yeah. City fights. So t- t- tell us about, uh, briefly to interrupt the, the flow probably, but uh, tell us about that lightning pod because when Fig and I left Harriers, that thing was, that that was not in existence yet. No. Looks the like air a pretty to air cool radar, piece of gear. We didn't have the APG-65 or the lightning pod one. Well, no. you know what? You, you know, so if people Google me and they see all the medals and Ribbons, you know, and I'm proud of all of them, you know, but, but it's basically your resume, right? On your chest. Sure. And, you know, and everybody goes, you know, and it's all the way it's designed is, you know, the most highest one is first and then the second and third and, you know, and Mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. But way down there, you know, is this meritorious service medal I got at when I was at Nav Air. I was the assistant program manager for systems engineering at Pax River. Right. And so this is way back nice. in, the, oh, when we were in Pax River. Two, all right. 97 through 2000. So the lightning pod wasn't out back then. 
right. 19, 1997, I'm at Pax River. And what an assistant program manager for system engineering does is anything that an upgrade to the ABAB, you know, you, you design it, you test it, you get funding for it, you put it on the Harrier. And, okay. and so like you were talking about, we were putting lightning pot on there. We were working with the Italians and the Spanish to put AMRAM on the airplane and JDAM on the airplane, right? It was a three-way circus. And at the time, the F-18 had the Nighthawk pod, right? And yeah. so no, all of a sudden, with that. the Israelis, yeah, it, it, it was the original version of the targeting pod. But it was, you know, think about it. How do you equate it? A flashlight, you know, that's just a big flashlight. Nowadays, we got, you know, flashlights that can really zoom in and have right. ultra high loom and, and all that. So the Nighthawk, so what bottom line is the, the nav air folks said, hey, Harriers, remember Harriers always were at the bottom of the barrel for funding anything. And they're like, right. if, you want a, if you want a targeting pod, you need to buy the Nighthawk. And you need to get on board with the F-18 and, you know, and share resources and all that. Well, the F-18 guys didn't want anything to do with this because our airplane does vertical landings. It rattles. It shakes. We have a lot more heat. So that made the design requirements, you know, when they're building the Nighthawk targeting pod, we instead of being a $2 million pod, it's going to be a $4 million pod to meet our requirements. So they basically sure. said, hey, stepsister. Go kick us to the curb. Ugly stepsister. Ugly stepsister. Well, the Israelis and Northrop Grumman, Raphael and Northrop Grumman came to us. And this is a complete fluke. And this, I thought it was all a scam. And they said, hey, we've got this thing called a lightning pod. And we'd like you to demonstrate that you can use it on the Harrier. And this Israeli guy said... Oh, and you don't have to change your software because what we're going to do is we're going to jerry rig it. So like if you if you push the the wink button, it will make you go from wide attack to narrow attack on the basically whatever button you push on your airplane instead of doing what it's supposed to do, it'll do what we want the lightning pod to do. And I'm like, "Okay, wow. you know, and I'm not an IT guy, but I push the I believe button." Yeah. And they said, <laughs> we'll, fund the, we'll fund the demo. We'll fund, you know, all the software and all the writing. If you'll just let us take your pot, take this pod, take it to China Lake, put it on a Harrier and prove it to you. So we did a little demo. And sure enough, it was Punky Brewster. Oh, Bob yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Punky Brewster. Punky Brewster was the test pilot. And he's okay. like, hey, I want the button to do this. And when I do this, I want the pod to do this. And he goes, and, and the Israeli guy is always like, no problem. I can do that. He'd always say, no, no problem. problem. I He's can no do problem. that. And then Bob Claypool was our money guy up at headquarters okay. Marine Corps. You know, I needed $500,000 to do this demo. And I was the engineer to put it all together. Bottom line is we got this lightning pod demo, made a tape of it, took it to assassin, Lieutenant General Gosh, uh, McCorkle, Fred McCorkle, McCorkle. assassin. Yes, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. in, in the back of the helicopter, Vietnamese. Fred McCorkle, if you're listening, we want you on, sir. Yes, you're. <laughs> he was an awesome guy, but I had to go pitch the lightning pod to him and say that, hey, we don't want to buy the Nighthawk one because it's too expensive. It's four million dollars a pod. You know, it, it'll be another five years before we get it. However, I can buy 14 of these right now, you know, by getting on this Air Force, Air National Guard contract. You know, it's all mumbo yep. jumbo. But okay. basically, typical Marine Corps, you know, mafia. I, I figured out a way to get on the contract. We can get it cheaper. You know, we can get it faster. We can it get it. fell off the back of a truck. We're going to get it. Right. Deal. I mean, I'm surprised yeah. you didn't go, you know, walk them out of a hangar next door in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> I know where I can get 13 of these things tonight. Yeah. You just got to believe me, boss. <laughs> and, Forget about and it. And Lieutenant General McCorkle, you know, kind of shook his head. And I remember, <laughs> you know, he, he has his minions behind him. They're going, that's unexecutable. It's, you know, it's not feasible. And McCorkle, you know, thought about it and he goes, 
go buy 14 of them. Here's the money. Oh, that's and badass. Like, Holy mackerel. We bought 14 of Boom. these. Boom. And from there, you know, it went to lightning one and they upgrade to lightning two and then blah, blah, blah. And it snowballed. But that was way back in 1997. And they wrote me up for a meritorious service medal. You know, back then, you know, it was, I thought, I think I actually helped the Marine Corps. You know, I, we were never going to get a targeting pod. We were never, you know, by hook, crook, and probably illegal contracting and everything else. We finagled to get 14 of these pods just to prove the concept. And from there, it just snowballed, you know, and all that. And so every time I look at that, I'm nice. like, yeah, yeah there it is. is. There's one hanging right yeah. there. Yeah. And then, you know, later on, we put it in this, you know, we had to design it to put it on the center line. You know, yep. it used to always be on the right on a pod, taking up a station. And it just got better and better and better. And in fact, I remember in 2003, I was using that one of the early versions of the lightning pod, the F-18 guys were using the Nighthawk and it was nighttime. We were off the USS Baton and I had my pod on and I was lazing and using the IR marker and talk, you know, and up there, you know, everybody's up on the same net in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I remember the F-15 guys going, how are you, you know, we're up at 15, 20,000 feet. And I'd go, no, no, you don't want to hit that target. That target's already been hit. And like, what do you mean it's already been hit? And I go, because I can see in my lightning pod, you know, the the acuity I've got is it's already been hit. And they go, well, which one hadn't been hit? And I said, well, let me put a laser marker on, you know, the the revetment, you know, 100 yards away. And they go, that one right there. And they go, all right, hold it there. I'm going to drop a laser bomb on it. And all right, I go, giddy up. And, the, and they go, finally, after, you know, four or five of these runs, they're like, what are you carrying? And I go, we got Can't the lightning. Can't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you, dude. <laughs> I said, it's, it's the lightning pod. And they go, oh, we got this piece of shit Nighthawk thing, you know, and it, we can't see it's all granular and it's all, you know, and I'm like, all right, well, you know, buy some of our stuff then maybe. Yeah, see, and that's how it's, <laughs> that's how it was supposed to work, right? Yeah, there. It, was, I that, just, it was beautiful. Yeah, Absolutely. That is beautiful. outstanding. Well, so where did those first that. 14 go? Did, did you split them up amongst gun no, squadrons yeah. or did one you know, squadron then, get them all? Then the, exactly. Then the politics got in all that. Yeah. So you get 14 of them, you know, and you get 135 Harriers and six or seven squadrons. I think we gave like, you know, two per squadron, you okay. know, and if they broke, then it was up to each mag to manage, you know, hey, if you're too broke. You know, but you're going to war. You can take all four. I mean, we let the mags figure it out, but that's okay. basically how it was divided early. Okay. Yeah. But then every jet had one by the end, right? Yeah, by the end. Well, once you started yeah. proving the concept and upgrading it and, you know, it got better and better. The displays got better and better. It just, you know, it took off and, you know. And right. Yeah, and I had to carry, you know, like in Desert Storm where I had to carry six Mark 82s, drop all of them and hope I hit something now you know you're putting it <laughs> right <laughs> put it right through the uh, window yeah now you exactly you're lazing it and you're tracking it all the way to the impact yeah. and so they yeah they bought one per airplane I, and i don't even know how many they finally bought but god bless them for finally putting the money up well that's pretty awesome and that was your baby oh that like, was i was involved yeah. in it you know it yeah, was well, you, yeah. Well, yeah you, you were the guy there that made it happen though it, and it, you and yeah, and it was so and, much. That's awesome. It was so much mafia going on. I mean, it, yeah. if you did it by the book, you know how acquisition requires. You write a contract, you know, do this design, do this development. It, we never would have got it. It was just yeah, that's why it takes you know twenty years to get an airplane from you know test to the fleet. It's stupid. It's obsolete when it hits the fleet. Yeah, it, yeah. that's exactly right. You know. That's it. There it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. It's got a bone locked up. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, Sticks. So that, that was, was awesome a photo picture. up on our. Yeah, indeed. That was a, that was a photo up there at uh, on the uh, on the live stream. If you want to see, go look go look for it there. It's at about. Uh, let's see. Forty one minutes into it. Yeah, forty one. But for this show, yeah, oh. forty one minutes into this to the live stream. There you go. Yeah. So up, uh, which is up on YouTube. So that's outstanding. Damn. And so you took over this 542 in the desert. Yeah. And that was unusual. And, you know, yeah. okay. 
at that I time, you know, I just remember I was the EXO. I was waiting to take over. And, you know, and as soon as we, we had to change a command there in combat, you know, it was literally, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning, do a quick ceremony by 11 o'clock on the CO. By noontime, the old CO is on an airplane, you know, flying out. Slam Arnold, great guy. God bless him. I mean, he was just super turnover. And then now I got a squadron and I'm in BMA 542 at Al-Assad, you know, with my, and, and the, and at that time we had not only 542 with our airplanes, but they also gave the debt to me. Gosh, I can't even remember the debt that six plane debt they assigned to me. Was it, uh, plus was it a Yuma squadron? Yeah. Yuma squadron. And I don't, I, I just remember 20 plus their six was 26. Plus I had six more BMA 542 on a boat debt, you know, so I, you were, you know, you're a squadron CEO of 32 Harriers. Wow. You know, that's a reinforced yeah. squadron. Yeah. yeah it was kinda, and it was kind of cool, you know, yeah. you know, but you, you don't have direct control over the ones that were on the boat debt, but they technically were yours and, you know, and that actually sounds worse to me because know, you know yeah. you're going to get your nuts chopped off if they screw something up, but you don't have any control as to what's going on. Repeat that is so true. I mean, <laughs> and you know how the Marine Corps is. It's like, as yeah. long as you're doing good, we love you. But as yeah. soon as you, you know, pump one into the stands, you're done. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, out of that tour, here's a good story for you. So out of that tour, to, to relate to what you just said. BMA 542 was nominated and awarded ABAB Attack Squadron of the Year, right, at a, when we came yeah. out of Desert Storm. So I go to Las Vegas, you know, and I stand up there and I get the award, you know, on behalf of BMA 542. I come back to Cherry Point and, you know, it's now six months later, so it's like 2005, and, you know, we'd been home from the war for about six months. And Odie Bachman punches out of one of my airplanes. He has a, he's doing lat in Pamlico Sound. And he's flying around and he, he climbs, rolls over, and the airplane has a vapor lock or something like that. But basically it, it blows up. He punches out and... There's an AV-8B splashed in Pamlico Sound. He's okay. Airplane's trash. You know, I go see him at the hospital and all that stuff. But I crash an airplane. Five days later, <laughs> five days <laughs> later, I'm Gosh, sending out across country. And Lieutenant Colonel, and he wasn't a Lieutenant Colonel back then, but uh, school field, school is coming home from across country and he gets a total electrical failure that's never been done in the Harrier before it. And I don't even remember what something burnt up, but he has no, he has no fuel indications, no RPM indications, no airspeed indications. It's a total electrical failure daytime. He's coming back to cherry point. And so he's like, he can't get the gear down. And so He's like, what do I do? I don't know. You know, I can't do a vertical landing because I don't know, you know, I need to be below 1,200 pounds, but my fuel is stuck at 2,700 pounds. And so even though he's, he can full, he can pull, push power, and pull power and hear the engine climbing and descending, but he has no idea when he's going to run out of gas, what his RPM is. Oh, so he decides to do, well, the best he can do is blow the gear down and do a... Uh, RVL. Okay, rolling rolling, rolling landing. vertical landing. Rolling yep. vertical landing. Rolling vertical landing. Slow as he can, but he doesn't realize that his nose gear didn't come down because there's no indications. Right. You know, that the right. gear is yeah. up or gear is down. Yeah. Nope. nope Bottom nope. line, he lands the airplane and the nose isn't down. So when he lands, the nose does hit the ground and, and snaps the, uh, you know, breaks the nose of the aircraft. And it's a radar aircraft, right? So it's a so class those are free. A. Yeah, those are a <laughs> couple million dollars worth of damage. So there's another class A five days later. 
Oh, boy. So here's the story. Six months ago, Russ Samborn, Lieutenant Colonel Russ Samborn, Bart, rock star, squadron of the year. Tax uh, tax squadron squadron of the year. year. (laughs) Six months later, I'm standing in front of the group skipper's desk at parade rest. And the comment is, I would fire you today if I could find another lieutenant colonel. <laughs> so I'm like, wow, I went from rock star to tethered goat in front of Godzilla. Yeah. Oh and gosh. not a good kind of goat. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, and, and, and long, you know, long story short, it came back. O.D. Bachman's airplane was a engineering design failure. Some fuel coupling wasn't put together properly. So it wasn't like a maintenance malfunction, wasn't something we did, wasn't operational, wasn't, you know, he did something bad. On Schoolfield's airplane, same thing. They had never seen this failure. It was a design mechanical failure on this black box, you know, that shorted out, caused an electrical yeah. error. They, they, a year later, they designed some major fix to make it fix it, you know, or whatever. But that doesn't matter, right? When you crash two airplanes in five days, somebody's yeah. got to, you know, be sacrificed yeah. on the altar. And there is was, obviously a leadership problem going. There on. is a. Yeah. Leader, I have lost confidence in you. you. Have lost you control. You are. You are a has been. You're a loser. Yeah. You're. You oh know. my gosh! And I went back they, and I had an AOM and I told my squadron. I said, <laughs> I said, guys. <laughs> The only reason I'm your CEO is because they can't find a lieutenant colonel to replace me right now. But as soon as they do, you know, thank <laughs> yeah. you for working for me, and I love you all. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Hey, as a side note, B O D Bachman was his call sign B T O by chance? No, it was O D. Overdrive. Okay. okay. Overdrive. Okay. Great okay. guy. I think nice. I went to okay. I think I went to fax school with him. Actually. Yeah, he was he was one of my WTIs. Uh huh. Just a rock star. Nice. Rock star. nice. Um, all right. Great story, though. Holy shit! I'm glad they, I'm glad you didn't get fired. Yes. Or did you? <laughs> yeah, he moved on. I moved on. You know, I made it through. <laughs> I mean, right? Oh but that's the Marine Corps Just, for you, right? The Marine Corps is exactly. always looking for somebody to pin the tail on. So there I was thinking about all you aspiring airline pilots, or those of you out there looking to get your type rating. Well. You're in luck because today I want to tell you about Flight Training International or FTIRatings.com and why it's the place you want to be if you're serious about elevating your pilot game. Since its inception back in 1993, FTI has been laser focused on raising the standards of pilot training. Now, let me tell you something. FTI isn't just another flight school. No, no. It's veteran-founded and designed to deliver high-quality, cost-effective training across the board. Whether you're aiming for the Airbus or Boeing, they've got you covered. The simulators they use aren't just fancy toys. These are full-motion, FAA-certified beasts that give you the exact conditions you're going to face in the real world and on your type ride or your ATP check ride. So, we're talking about the kind of simulators that make you sweat, but... You know, in a good way. And what makes it even better? The instructors. These aren't just any instructors. They're professionals who've been where you are. Most of them come from a military background and have logged thousands of hours flying commercial airliners around the globe. Let me be clear. This isn't your typical flight school stuff. FTI is all about upping your game to get that ATP, the advanced certification you need before you can even think about sitting in the cockpit of a Part 121 airliner. FTI also offers the Airline Transport Pilot Certification Training Program, or ATP-CTP, which is the mandatory prerequisite for getting your ATP rating. This program was mandated by Congress to ensure pilots are fully equipped to meet the demands of modern aviation, and it's the essential step that prepares you for the highest level of certification in the industry. And here's the kicker. You can access all of their training materials wherever you are, thanks to their slick iPad app. So there's no need to log around heavy books or sit in a stuffy classroom. Now here's something just for our listeners. If you sign up for your first course at FTI and mention, so there I was, they'll give you a cool $100 off. Yeah, you heard that right. And whether you're a seasoned pilot looking to sharpen your skills or a military aviator, 
looking to transition into commercial aviation, FTI is where you want to be. So what are you waiting for? Check out FTIRatings.com. That's FTIRatings.com. Join the ranks of their alumni, which includes pilots from the Air Force, Navy, and even the FAA. If they trust FTI, you can too. And don't forget, you can use your veterans' benefits to cover the cost of training at FTI. So gear up, check your pre-flight, and get ready for takeoff. Head over to FTIRatings.com today and start your journey towards becoming a top-tier airline pilot. Don't just fly. Soar with FTI. How true was it? I mean, were there no lieutenant colonels, or was he just saying that? Well, he, he was kind of a... <laughs> he was a wild card himself. Because it was, a, yeah, it was just a good old-fashioned ass-chewing is what it was. Yeah, it he was. Needed, you know, he, need, he needed to chew ass just he, he needed to, to say he did something. Yeah. yeah. And, and he remember, and get it off his chest. That. As Marine <laughs> officers, we all know that, you know, you got your problems, your boss has problems, your boss's boss has problems, you know, and everything flows yeah. downhill. So, yeah. So he know, probably you know. had his ass. He probably had his ass chewed an hour he or two before. And he, he was going to have yours, right? Yep. And I remember <laughs> Dog Davis was my commanding general. <laughs> When I was a Maxio and got, and I love that man, but he worked me like a dog and rightfully so. I mean, I was his Maxio and, you know, it was my job to perform. And he was like, Bart, fix this, fix that, you know, and, you know, and you're blamed for everything. And when you do, and he was one of those guys that would quote, he goes, Bart, you did a great job yesterday, but I don't really care about yesterday. I care about today and tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) And and, and I was on board with that. Because I was what have you done for me lately? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What have you done for me lately? Your fitness report is based on your performance in the future. I think you're going to be a great, you know, whatever the next rank is. Nice. Yeah. So nice. pressure, oh baby. Pressure. No. That's no. why I have no hair. There you go. <laughs> oh my gosh! You've, right. got a, you've got a massive head of hair for crying out loud. That looks a, that's a beautiful head. Well, of compared hair. to Fig. Yeah. Compared <laughs> to you, Fig. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's, oh, so, any any All good right. uh, combat stories from uh, Iraq from when your tour when you were a skipper? Actually, let's go. I, I got one for you. In, okay. <laughs> go for one. I, don't, I have no. So this is two thousand and three. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Remember, we went to Iraq January of two thousand and three, and we yep. did the Harrier carrier. So the USS Bataan had, I don't know what we have, 24 aircraft on board. Okay. And the USS Boneharm or Shard had another 24 on it. And then plus we had some that were land-based, right? And Al okay. Jabber and all that. But we went back yep. in January 2003. And basically we were, we were going back into Iraq and we were going to okay. take Saddam down. But the Harrier carriers is what we were a part of. So I'm the okay. I'm the Lieutenant Colonel XO working for Frank Botter, Lieutenant Colonel Botter, Boris. Oh yeah, Boris. I'm his, yeah, I'm his XO. And this okay. is the first time back in Iraq since I've been shot down. You know, so this okay. is what 10 years later. Okay. And uh, so I'm not the CO, but we're on this Harrier carry and the baton had the night shift, the Bone Homer shot had the day shift. And so it was you know, we had it like from eight o'clock at night till five in the morning. We would do our launches and then the Bonhomme Rashad would do it, you know, from five in the morning till eight at night. They did the daytime missions and that's okay. the way we kind of ran things. And on our ship was VMA 542, the entire squadron and VMA 223, the Bulldogs. So we had, we used to say cats and dogs were sleeping together. There you go. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, And, you know, so I'm the XO back in Iraq. And truthfully, you know, everybody was like, hey, what do you, you know, you're, you're back in Iraq. Remember 12 years ago, you were shot down. You were a prisoner of war. Like you I, forgot. I, I, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, I didn't, didn't oh, yeah. remember that. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, maybe I should think this one through a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's like, well, brilliant. Our, 
you know, and first of all, I'm thinking, do I really have a choice? You know, it's not like, hey, I've decided right. I don't want to go back. You know, so yeah. I, I'm going to. Yeah. No, Let's sit this that, one out. That, Come on. Well, yeah, that's not going to happen. And then the other side of the coin was, you're crazy. You're nuts. You go back. You know what they're going to do the second time they ki- catch you? You know, <laughs> you, you got right. away with it the first time. But the second time, you know, you, you're going to be somebody's best friend, you know, or uh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> right. So I just kind of discounted, and then and then they also thought about, well, are they even going to let you go back? I mean, is there some policy or rule that says, hey, you were shot down, you're a prisoner of war in World War II, you can't ever go fight the Germans again, or you know, you can't fight the Iraqis, <laughs> right, right, right? Sure. And I'm like, right. I have no idea, but I'm not going to ask the question because that just opens up a can of, you know, once you get yeah. lawyers involved, you know, and policy people. Oh, you. Oh, that sounds like a bad So idea. Boris, God bless that guy. I love him too. He said, Bart, just shut up. And you know, you're my XO. We're told to go get on the ship and go, go get on the ship, get on the ship. And that's, you know, the <laughs> Marines, what do we do? We do what we're told, right? We hear gunfire, we run to it. And so I was XO on board and my, now I have a family, you know, I didn't have a family in desert storm other than my wife. But now I've got a a 10 year old kid. (laughs) And as I was getting on board the ship, he he goes, Dad, so you're going back to Iraq? And I go, Yes, sir. Yeah, I am. And he goes, All right. Well, this time, son, or or this, my son says this to me. He goes, And a 10 year old. Well, this time, Dad, fly higher, fly faster. (laughs) So I'm like, You you got it. You figured it out. (laughs) Sage advice from the mouths of babes. (laughs) Fly higher, fly faster, Dad. And yeah, so, you know, that's exactly what I did. (laughs) Anytime I was over Iraq and bad guy territory, I was like, Damn, that throttle doesn't go far enough forward. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Can can we get a little higher? Let's go a little higher. Isn't there an afterburner on this thing? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And where's my second engine? But anyway, oh. I, I, you know, we would fly night missions off the, off the baton. You know, I flew this four plane division and I don't know why I did this, but you know, as the XO, I, I, I told the guys, Hey, let's do something different. <laughs> you know, that, that's like a first lieutenant saying, oh, Hey, I got oh. an idea. Yeah. Hold on. You know? I got a question. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Exactly. Okay, I got an idea. I'm not Hold sure why beer. I thought it through. What's this? <laughs> but I oh, convinced these young captains that were flying with me. I mean, yeah, I guess they respected me. And they're like, hey, he's, he's a lieutenant colonel. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. And I said, okay, we're going to go. He's been shot down. It'll never happen again. Yeah, he, he's, <laughs> he's, he's prone to not wanting to get shot down, right? So we're safe. Yeah. You know, and Saddam the same is shooting, you know, missiles at us as we flew over in AAA. But. So we took off and I said, hey, instead of doing our little, you know, four plane that, you know, you're cleared in, you know, clear, Fox, you know, drop your bombs. All right. Coming off target. Now the next guy in from a different piece of the sky, you know, all very tactically sound. For some reason, I got this wild hair up my ass and I said, let's do echelon right. Like they did in World War Two, you know, one airplane, two airplanes, three airplanes, four airplanes. (laughs) And I'm the lead, and I'm just going to roll in on my back, do a 30, 45-degree dive, you know, on whatever target they get us. Dash two, you just followed like 10 seconds behind me. Dash three, 10 seconds behind. There you go. There's the picture. Oh and they're like, gosh. okay, I haven't, I haven't done that in a long time or practiced that. or, <laughs> But that's what the skipper wants to do. We're going to do it. <laughs> so sure enough, we get assigned a target. And we got radar strobes, SA9s and 13s. But I'm like, hey, okay. you know, we got those all the time. So I roll in. And of course, Dash 1, when he rolls in, right, nobody knows you're coming, right? You're you're the first guy down the chute. Sure. So I get up. I roll in. I drop my bombs. I pull off. Dash 2 rolls in. They're now awake and alive and see you coming. So they turn in on their weapon systems and start shooting. Dash three is diving through a hail fire full of triple A, let's say nines and thirteens coming at him. And dash four says, hell, hell no. 
<laughs> he starts it, but he, he quickly pulls off target. We end up reforming finally. And the way the work, you, you took off from the ship, you landed at Al Jabber. You got more bombs, more gas, and you went on a second mission. You recovered on the ship. So when we landed at Al Jabber, you know, we all gathered around, got our intel up brief for the second mission. And all three of them looked at me like, goes, what the fuck were you thinking, Skipper? (laughs) (laughs) XO. And I go, yeah, "Yeah, that probably didn't work out so well. We're not going to do that on the second mission. So, (laughs) uh, you know, so all those people out there that think I knew everything about everything and I was always very conservative or whatever. Sometimes you just don't think it all the way through, you know? Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. I was just a knucklehead at that point. Yep, yeah. there I am. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. You know, you had yours. You were lead. You are no danger whatsoever. You're good to go. <laughs> follow me, boys. Yeah, follow me. Just it's kidding. Good. That's not the kind of leader Bart is. I promise you, everybody. Yeah. So, uh, we yeah. never did that again. We never did yeah. that again. Hey. You know, Bart, I, I got I to show you. I for them, and, and they were good about it. They're, you know, yeah. hey, Skipper, yeah. let's not do that. <laughs> oh, that pisses me off. You didn't buy enough for everybody. Hold on. Fake. There was only one. I got to show you this, Bart. Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, this is right. from that yeah, cruise yeah. you're talking about. Oh, where that, the, yes. Where the, where the dogs and cats were living together. Yes. I found this. I found one. On yeah. eBay. Nice. So he's holding up a Zippo lighter with a 223 squadron patch and the Iraqi Freedom on it. So That is awesome. And a Harrier etched on it as well. So Very good. Yeah. Should have bought enough for everybody, Fig. That's all that I got to say. The, that was from the dog and cat's <laughs> cruise I just found out. Yeah. Well, as a yeah. matter of fact, I would have, but there was only one. One. It's the last one ever. Yeah. You only bought yeah. one. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll share it with you. Can you can I'll, send it to me for Christmas. Yeah, it was I'll have it for six months. I'll give it to you for six months. We'll, there we'll, you go. we'll just ship it back and forth. All right. Well, here we are at the end of yet another episode, everybody, and we still haven't gotten to the good story. One of the good stories. These are great stories, so I denigrate them by, by saying that. Yeah. You did, did you get any of that repeat? Because really I, I didn't. If you could repeat yourself, uh, Bart, we'd appreciate it. You said something about 223. Oh, I was going to just, just say that just didn't give credit to... The CEO of 223 at the time the, the, the was uh, Pete Woodmansey. Oh, I mean, Woody. Just, what a, yeah, Woody. What a, so, I mean, you know, two Harrier squadrons, two egos, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Bodarf, you know, everybody wants to prove, you know, dog sniffers. You know, I'd sniff your butt, <laughs> you sniff mine. Uh, but those two really worked so well together. And, and in fact, I remember the skipper, Captain... Jaeger of the Baton. I mean, he was such a great guy, very unassuming. But what he would, oh boy, oh boy. when we kicked off the Marines, you know, a thousand Marines were also on board that ship and they kicked them off, you know, to go invade Iraq, you know, as wow. part of that task force, 51, I think it was. And I remember, you know, at the end of the Iraqi evolution, he came up on the 1MC, okay. you know, which is the, the, voice comm for the whole right. ship. And he goes, he goes, all right, Baton, tomorrow morning, we are going to bring back our thousand Marines that we kicked off, you know, been in Iraq for the last 45 days. Okay. They are dirty. They are stinky. They are muddy. They are tired. They are angry. And he says, you know what? You're going to welcome aboard them, each and every one of them. You're going to let them be oh. muddy and smelly and stinky. We can clean the ship later. But for 48 hours, leave them alone. We stop doing all the you know, the monkey stuff that we do. Leave them alone. Let them eat whenever they want. The chow hall stays open whenever they want. They sleep as long as they want. We cut off the bells and the whistles that they, you know, the ship has every, you know, at zero six in the morning. Sweepers, sweepers, man your brooms. Give the ship a sweet clean sweep down. He was one of those kind yeah. of guys. And so sure enough, when they came aboard, I mean, the place was just a mud fest. It was dirty. It was stinky. And for 48 hours, he just, 
He said, this is what we do for a living. We support the Marines. Yeah, I love that. I'm hearing radio silence now. So it sounds like some outstanding leadership from the ship's captain there. The the problem, Bart, is Fig and I got about 20% of that, and people watching yeah. the live stream got about 20% of that. But the beauty of StreamYard is it's going to come out in the podcast itself. It will upload a clean audio, which is why we use StreamYard, so that this internet skipping doesn't crap all over us. So I think this is a good place to end for this week, and we'll come back next week with the rest of our conversation with Bart. Thank you for your service, Bart. Much appreciated. Well, there I was crossing the pond, and you could see that I wasn't exactly fond of all the shit I was wearing on that day. Now an F-16 is cramped enough, but it's even worse with all that stuff supposed to save your life. But we knew there was no way. Cause when you're going down the North Atlantic, man, it's over. He, 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 what, it's what? He said it's over. Well, you better be yeah. a better pilot than I am, because yeah, I couldn't well, make it go. We all know that. That goes without saying. <laughs> Fig, for God's sake. <laughs> Boy, I walked right into that, didn't I? <laughs>